You're listening to the best of the bravest. Interviews with the FDNY's elite. This is a mini series to start out on a whim. And if you think about it, everything with this podcast has been done on a whim. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this very, very special milestone 200th episode of the Mike the New Haven podcast. Last year in September, we hit 100. That was with former, he recently retired, NYPD Deputy Commissioner of Intelligence and Counterterrorism, John Miller. And I started this really back in 2017 without a clue. I took a two-year break to finish college and get my driver's license and pretend to be a functional adult. And then I came back not knowing uh, what to do either way, you know, not having a clue either. But Slowly but surely, we've pieced everything together. And tonight, it comes together for this, the milestone 200th episode that I wouldn't have hit without you. And of course, it's fitting. I get somebody I've been working on for just about five years. Finally, he's here tonight. He couldn't escape me. And I'll introduce him momentarily. So just wanted to take a second to to say thank you. If I can speak English, that'd be great. Because like I said, we don't get here without you. 200, crazy to think. And who do we welcome for it? But my next guest, who spent close to 40 years with the FDNY, 37 to be exact. He joined the department in 1981, and he'd eventually become a chief climbing through the ranks. And he worked a lot of his career in Manhattan, as we'll talk about tonight. And it was on September 11th, 2001, of course, that he became a rather reluctant witness to history, witnessing the first plane strike the North Tower and subsequently becoming the first fire chief to enter the tower. It was his harrowing experience on that day that would lay the foundation for what would come later in his career. He was chief for a while for the FDNY's Planning and Strategy Division, and later on, it's Counterterrorism and Emergency Preparedness Bureau. He's an author, too. He recently penned his first book, Ordinary Heroes, which we'll discuss tonight. Finally, I get the chance to say this. For the 200th episode of the Mike the New Haven podcast in volume 23 of the Best of the Bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite, we welcome Chief Joe Pfeiffer. Chief, welcome. How are you? Uh, thank you, Mike. It's great to be on on your show, and congratulations on your 200th episode. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. It is indeed. It's fantastic to have you here for it. So the first question is always an easy one. Tell me where you grew up, Chief. I grew up in Queens, um, and I've I've stayed there my entire life. Stayed there your entire life. Did you grow up around the job? Did you have anybody any, anybody in your family on the job? No. Um, uh, my father was a letter carrier, so. Um, um, I didn't have any background in the job, but what I did have is, um, as a young, as a teenager, I became a, a lifeguard and then, um, a volunteer fire department, uh, within New York city. There's only about a half a dozen volunteer fire departments within the city itself. And I became a volunteer in the Rockaway point, uh, volunteer fire department. So uh, that started to get me interested in in um in in this, this sort of work if any of you have a question for the chief i promise i'll get to it at the proper time and i'll shout out to some of you uh in a moment of course chief joseph pfeiffer our guest for this milestone 200th episode so it's interesting that you mentioned that because i mean my goodness there's about a few volunteer companies in queens i think there's a couple in the bronx as well and it's really an unsung thing because you think about guys that start out with an interest in the fire service at the volunteer level, usually they're living out on Long Island because it's primarily volunteer. And that's what fosters the love. But working in a volley company, as you said, in Queens, in Rockaway, and I imagine seeing the FDNY up close and personal, that had to be it for you. It, it, it was. I, I went on ambulance calls mm -hmm. uh, with the volunteers. I was also part a, of a tournament team mm -hmm. um, that, that competed across New York State. I was an EMT. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and then I was a, a firefighter as a volunteer. I uh, rose to the rank of a lieutenant <laughs> as, a, as a teenager. And then one day, somebody brought in a bunch of applications for the FDNY. Um, and um, I was in college, and I was uh, excited about this work. So I filled out an application, and um, and I took the test. And um, it was one of those super, superman tests, <laughs> to be exact. Uh, we had to climb an eight-foot wall. We had to run a mile. We, we had to pull hose and carry, carry uh, dummies upstairs. It, it, it was quite a test. But I, um, I was fortunate to be an, an athlete. And uh, I, I did well on that and, and the written test. And um, in 1981, I was called to uh, join the uh, FDNY. 
So you have, and what's interesting about the time in which you came on, and I always like talking about this with guys who came on during the latter half of the seventies into the early eighties is you're coming off, you're coming on the job just off the heels of the war years, just off that really crazy 14 year period where the city was burning left and right. Arson for arson for profit was unfortunately King. And a lot of these guys not only were fighting these fires, they were Vietnam veterans. So you talk about seasoned salty men. You were really learning. This is no disrespect to the other eras. You really learn from the best of the best. And I imagine that, you know, of course, coming in with prior experience is one thing, but still it had to be quite the eye and eye opener to be around these guys. Oh, it, it was amazing. Uh, the, the people I was around, I, I was first assigned to um, Engine 234 in, in Brooklyn, 234 and Ladder 123 in Crown Heights. Mm -hmm. And even though this was the latter part of those war years that you just described, it was really busy. I went to a job, and I'm not exaggerating this at all, one, at least one fire every tour, and, and many times two, three as maybe four fires in, in one tour. So I learned from those experienced people and having to do the job right there on the spot. So I was going to say, because, you know, working in Brooklyn, the classic term for a firefighter in Brooklyn is ghetto firefighter or ghetto fireman. I'm sure you've heard that expression thrown around many a time. And it's really true. And it's not a put down to the borough. It's the opposite. Because the borough is the largest of the five, there's so much work to go around. And I remember, and I always love quoting this, the great Bob Gallione, a legend of rescue too, mentioned to me mm. on this show that you could make a mistake at a fire at 6.30. You could rectify it by 8.30 because there was so much work back then. Exactly. So if I put force the door this way or I move the hose that way and it wasn't right, or well, the next job, I, I corrected it. And, um, and, and ghetto firefighter, um, it's an endearing term but we were connected to the community yeah. um, and we were closely connected because there were so many fires. People trusted the firefighters um, and literally we, we could walk into anyone's home and, and, and they'd feel that this, this level of trust. So it was, it was an incredible time being in a community that was challenged by fires and, and violence um, we had shootings in front of the firehouse every week. We had to put in our own bulletproof glass. Uh, but but um, there was something special working in, in, in those busy areas and, 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 and helping a community that, that needed us uh, desperately. And at that time, of course, it was the fire department that was coming off the layoffs, too. So it was really beginning to replenish its ranks. I will say, do you remember your first fire? Um, I have a, a vague memory of it. Um, going in and feeling, feeling the heat from the fire. And what I remember is not being able to see anything because of the dark smoke. And um, on, my, on my knees crawling in and then opening up the nozzle and starting to, to cool the room down. And th that, that's about all I remember. That was really hot and smoky. <laughs> and somebody probably trying to take the nozzle from you, I imagine, too. <laughs> no, they said, kid, go ahead. You got it. <laughs> oh, good. Good. You know, we're talking with Chief Joseph Pfeiffer here. This is volume 23, The Best, The Bravest, and of course, The Milestone, episode 200. Shout out to everybody in the chat tonight. Chris Fillmore, John Albanese. If I miss some of you, don't get mad at me. Joe Maliga, Christian Williams, uh, Alicia B, da Dawn Marie, of course, Stu Kelsall, tuning in from across the pond in England. It's about midnight over there, just past midnight. So thank you, Stu. William Cooney and uh, Howard Blank, retired NYPD Taru detective, and Bill Kennedy, retired NYPD emergency service sergeant. He worked in one truck. Uh, in Manhattan, as well as four truck in, in the Bronx and seven truck in Brooklyn. Uh, and he was just on this show. So check out that episode if you haven't. So, you know, I will say this Proby's coming in. There's always a term that's thrown around black cloud, white cloud. And we kind of heard about it, the Dawn Day Brothers documentary. That's where I first learned of it. You know, you come in and either you're a black cloud, fires from all over the city follow you around, and there's always work to go around when you're on the tour. White cloud, the polar opposite, nothing happens. Which one were you, or were you, dare I say, somewhere in between? As a as a firefighter, we had had so many jobs; it, it really didn't matter. No, I <laughs> because imagine. everybody was a a, 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 a black cloud. <laughs> um, what was interesting later in my career, as I became a staff chief, 
I became the dark cloud, the black cloud, um, um, and had some of the largest fires in, in New York City's history. Mm-hmm. So I guess we could talk about moving up the ranks because guys, there are certain guys, and listen, if you get on the job either in the PD or the FD and you just stay a fireman or strictly a police officer the entirety of your career, there's nothing wrong with that because in New York City, there's plenty to do and plenty to see and you could have your fill with that rank alone. But you get those other guys and gals that are eager to move up, that are eager to be the next leaders and lead the next uh, or lead the departments respectively into the next generation. When did the idea first enter your head of, I mean, well, granted, you've been a lieutenant in the Valley, so I imagine that spurred the seed to want to do the same in the FDNY? Actually, from day one. So we have tons of books, thousands of pages of books of procedures and laws to read. And from day one, I started to study. One, I, I needed that knowledge just to do my job. Yeah. And and then I, I, I wanted to be... A, um, a lieutenant, a, a boss. And the firehouse I was in, everybody wanted to do the same thing. Mm. It turned out that, that we put something like two dozen people on the promotion list. That's unheard of for one firehouse. But, but what it was is we're going to jobs every day. We were learning it. Uh, we were studying. We created study groups together. So not only do we do our time in the fire uh, in the firehouse and the overtime, but we met separately and studied for three hours in a study group once a week. So it it, it was it was challenging. Oh, to say the least, I imagine. And and it's sometimes you don't get promoted right away. You could pass the test, but they'll give you depending on your on your rank and how much time you have on the job. They'll make you wait a few years before they promote you. A- a- absolutely, matter of fact. It's so competitive in the FDNY that about 85% of the people who pass the test or take the test, they never get called. Mm, yeah. Or it takes them years to get called. Or it takes, it takes years. It's, it's, it's like uh, taking the test. It's like, uh, it's, it's like the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. It comes up every four years. <laughs> so if you miss one, you have four years to wait. <laughs> no, of course. And that's why I get, and I, I'm sure New York is not the only place that does this. You see so many guys, they'll, they'll take both tests. They'll start off with the police department. And then if they really, really want the fire department, they'll roll over from yeah. the police department to the fire department because it counts as city time. And at least you're doing something for the city while you wait for what you really want. You know, so I, I, I get that now because, it, as you said, eight million people naturally in one in one city. Of course, everything is going to be competitive. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and it's a great job. Oh, and, of course. And that's why people want to be be part of it. And it actually becomes better as you grow in your career. How long did you stay in 234-123? Um, just under six years. And I got promoted to lieutenant, and I was assigned to uh, to Queens, the 14th division, so the, the northern part of, of Queens. Yeah, I was having that discussion the other day with a friend of mine from Squad 288. Of course, the Jet mm. friends know him, Kevin Kubler. Uh, you know that he's a one third of the Getting Salty Experience podcast and uh, does a great job with that. And the joke about them is Queens Marines, you know, and it's said both amongst the PD and the FD. But really, Queens is putting in a lot of work. Always has always will. So going there, even though it's not the same as Brooklyn, do you feel that, well, this is a two-part question. Do you feel that your experiences in Brooklyn, those six years of being so busy, served you well? And how much of an adjustment period was it to a different borough? Because each borough, even though the common theme is fires, does have different types of emergencies that are unique to that specific borough. Yeah. Each borough is is very, very different. Mm -hmm. But by being so busy in Brooklyn and being promoted really pretty young, <laughs> um, that it was that experience that I brought to the, to being a, a new lieutenant. And I was as, assigned to uh, a ladder 128. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and we, we ran into fires in Queens, in, um, in Long Island City, in Sunnyside, and also into into Greenpoint in Brooklyn, and we also had we we also had uh, the Long Island Expressway and the BQE, so major highways, and we prepared for that. 
there was a, a junkyard within our district uh, where they were, would crush cars. So for a drill, I brought the guys to the, the junkyard and we ordered a, a half a dozen cars. And with our hearse tool, uh, we would tear them apart and, and people, the firefighters would learn. And then after a couple two hours, it's like, um, okay, guys, <laughs> exercise, the drill is over. Let's go back to the firehouse. They go, no, 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 Lou, we want to do another car. <laughs> And that, you know, that's that's the life work you ask in New York City, any ESU cop or any fireman doesn't even have to be a rescue fireman. The hearse tool. I always ask them it's in one of the rapid fire questions. What's your favorite tool? Common theme. They tell me hearse tool, because I think I think it might have been a friend of mine from ESU from Seven Truck in Brooklyn that said this. And she's so right. Maddie Lawrence is her name that you're not taking you're not taking the person out of the car with that tool. You're essentially taking the car off the person. Yeah. That's yeah. And, and then we get to to work on the person mm -hmm. and save their lives. So yeah. we don't get into the car. You can't do the, the first aid that, that that's going to make a difference on whether they live or not. As a new Lieutenant coming in, how much reliance did you put on the senior man once he got to your house? Um, the, 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 the senior firefighter in a house is always the informal leader. And, and that's the person that every officer um, and chief d depends on because you get things done that way. And, um, and it, it was no different where, where I was. So you talked about handling some pretty major fires. And, you know, again, during the 80s, just because the warriors were over, at least in their peak, it doesn't mean that any times got any less busy. During the 80s, there was still plenty of fire duty to go around, really into the early 90s. So tell me about some of those fires from that time period that stick out for you. Uh, such a long time ago, and there's so many other big ones uh, since then. Yeah. Um, what, do I, what do I remember during the, the time? We, we had big fires um, where apartment buildings were burning and um and we we, we ran in and I, I i remember as a firefighter making a rescue pulling a woman out and um getting a not a big award but a class a but one of the things i remember as a firefighter in uh in the late 80s in the 80s um it was a snowstorm and um, and and the ambulance couldn't get through, but with our fire truck with chains on the reel on our wheels, we were able to get through. And this young woman was having a baby. And because of my EMT experience, and we we had our own uh, OB kit on on the rig, uh, we went in there, uh, and I spoke to her, and we. We delivered the baby. I, 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 I delivered the baby in the middle of the snowstorm. And the, the greatest feeling was, was he hearing that baby cry. Yeah. And then the, the next day, and then we were able to carry her to, a, to the main road and the baby and, and get her in the ambulance to the hospital. But the next day, um, my, my fire unit, my, my engine company, um, we go to the hospital to see the mother and the baby. And we saw the baby, and the baby was was doing well and healthy. And I walk into the room, and the mother didn't recognize me at all. And I'm like, "Oh, heartbroken! Wait a minute, I just delivered your baby." But as soon as I talked, she recognized my voice because during the whole procedure, I just kept talking to her, and it was just a wonderful um, moment. And there's, the, I think, a, a daily news picture of. of of us with the mother and the baby. And it's one of those moments you'll never forget. And uh, it, it was a real special time besides all the fires we've done. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a special moment. Cause I think around that time, and this is way before the merger with EMS in 96, that is that when they started giving the fire department, the CFRD runs? Yeah. Yeah. It, it took a while. Um, so what we did in the, in the, my early days, we made a patch that we put on our coat, that said FDNY EMT. <laughs> there was no such thing, but we did it anyway. Um, and and getting uh, EMS 
as part of the FDNY, I believe in 1996, mm-hmm. was fantastic. Um, it was things that, that we dreamt of, and then we became one department, and it, it was it, it was it was good. It was good for the city. I think so. I think that was the time of mergers because you've you're right. It was in '96 because the year before that's when the three police departments merged: housing, transit, and the NYPD into one. And then you get that merger of the FDNY uh, and EMS in '96. Uh, if you want to hear a previous episode, I discussed that with Zachary Goldfarb, himself, former staff mm-hmm. chief, who you probably crossed paths with. Uh, I know Zach there. well. Oh, yes. yeah, he's a good guy. He was just on the show uh, for one of the previous volumes of Best of the Bravest. And it was interesting hearing his perspective on the merge. So, you know, I guess with that said, getting back to the ascent uh, in your career, you made lieutenant. You were a lieutenant for a while. When did you make captain? Uh, I made, made captain in, let's see, I made lieutenant in eight. Uh, in 87, um, 86, um, and then I made a captain in 93. And I was yes. assigned to Manhattan. Okay. And I bounced around uh, Manhattan, both the in Midtown on the east and the, and the west side. Um, so from, from, the, uh, from the UN to the uh, to Lincoln Center <laughs> and a little bit into, into Harlem. And um, Everybody wanted that the spots, and uh, I didn't get it, so I wound up putting for a spot in Queens, and I went back to Queens. Uh, th- this time in a in a, in Jackson Heights on on, on Northern Boulevard, another busy uh, busy house, a lot of private dwellings and apartments. So you know it's interesting. I'll get to Manhattan in a second. Because really, and that's something that I love talking about with firemen specifically, every building is different. Uh, an apartment complex versus private dwellings, of course, uh, taxpayers and cockloffs as well. You really have to know the building. And a lot of you guys, I mean, it doesn't matter where you're a firefighter at. You guys will do building inspection from time to time. Mm-hmm. You know, some lieutenants and captains like to do it. Others don't for a variety of reasons. How often will you take the guys and drill them specifically in that so that if you ever had a job there or something like there, they would know what to do. Building inspections, besides trying to make the building safe for the, the occupants, is also a wonderful way for, for firefighters to learn their building. And so as we walked around and trying to, to find violations and to, to correct those, but we also pre-planned. So we would talk through different scenarios. If a fire occurred here, what would we do? If it occurred over here, how does that make it different? So building inspection, not only part of the job, but it's the way we prepare for the next event. Yeah, and that's so key because you talk about getting to Manhattan at least briefly in 1993. Was that after the 93 Trade Center bombing or before? Um, I, I, actually, I got there um, after the, the, the bombing. Mm-hmm. 93 bombing but as a lieutenant i was called after the the 93 bombing uh after the 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 first response to sit in the lower levels of the world trade center um about six floors below looking at this football field of a rubble (laughs) (laughs) so uh i didn't respond that day but I was part of the, the overall response to the first uh, uh, World Trade Center bombing in 93. I think Dennis Tardio told me the same thing. He said he called it babysitting, basically babysitting the crater down there, maintaining an yes. FDNY presence. But it's, it doesn't even have to be an emergency as extreme as that, which was a terrorist attack. I mean, Manhattan presents so many unique challenges because think about it. They're always building something. The propensity for construction accidents is high. Naturally, with a lot of high rises, the high rise fires are a challenge. You know, there's the medical emergencies that can happen. They're hardly ever on the first floor. Car accidents, foot traffic. So you have, you know, accidents with pedestrians as well. I mean, it's a, it's a cavalcade of work to go around. And you, we talked earlier about every borough being different. How much of an eye-opening experience was Manhattan for you, even with how seasoned you were by this point, seeing what went on in that borough alone? Yeah, I, I got to Manhattan as a battalion chief in in um, 97. That's when I was there full time. And, uh, and I was assigned to the, the, the first battalion. 
but Manhattan, as, as you, you were saying, is just so different. We're talking buildings a, a thousand feet in the air. Um, every building, so, so different um, and, and large. And you can't just run up the stairs. Okay, we're, we're good for 10 flights or so, um, thir 13 flights, maybe a little more. But after that, it gets tiring. Yeah. So how do we use elevators? Um, and then how do we deal with medical emergencies of, of all different kinds? Um, um, you know, in lower Manhattan, not only did we have to deal with the World Trade Center, we had the New York Stock Exchange, uh, we had B Battery Park, um, we had the, the whole financial district, and, and we had some pretty f famous people living in the city <laughs> in their own lofts. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, for me, I think one of the jobs as well is stuck elevators in these high rises. And I was talking about this with, uh, I believe it was Ray McCormack previously. You guys have a lot of different tools for that alone. Z wire, some of the other tools that go into it. You know, you're always, as you said earlier, having to stay a step ahead because you just never know what Manhattan could throw your way. Not even in terms of the emergencies, but just the uniqueness of the citizens that inhabit that borough. Yeah. Manhattan has people from around the world. Yep, and and um and certainly in New York City, there's over 200 languages spoke. Mm -hmm. So we we have this wonderful mix of cultures coming together in um in in a small location. So we would go on building inspection, and and we would hear these different languages and these different cultures, and uh, and every now and then you would get a wonderful whiff. Of of someone cooking a um, a, a meal from their the, their own uh, particular culture, and it's like wow, that, that that's that's pretty amazing. As a chief, you know, you go through the ranks, of course, lieutenant, captain. Gradually, when as, by this by the time you get to chief, you're obviously a seasoned leader. But there's a difference between a test taker and somebody who's actually a true leader. You know, leaders lead by example, not necessarily what they say, although that's important too, but what they do. So for you as a chief, especially working in a borough like that, what were the keys for essentially making sure that the men under you believed in you? The, the, the key is um, a number, a couple of things. One is during the, during the fire itself to remain calm. We don't need a chief or a boss yelling and screaming, jumping up and down. Because if that person's jumping up and down, well, that's not giving me a lot of confidence if I'm the firefighter. So I was very conscious of keeping a, a, a calm demeanor. But it's also what you do, or what I did when we, were go we weren't going to fires. Everyone knew that I, what was important to me, and every chief has their own little, little thing, mine was to sit on, on drills and to see how units train and not to to pick on them but to encourage them and to simply ask questions um how would you do this how would you do that um and and then give my my own ideas um i would also go around talking to each of the officers building that relationship up and that was a two-way street not only could they trust me but I could trust them. So I would hear their voice on the radio and I would know who they were. And I, that report meant more because I knew who that person was. But the biggest thing I think we did, and we still do in, 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 the, in the fire department, is that we share risk. It's not you go in there, it's follow me in. Um, and and we're going we're doing this together and it's so true because and i do have a couple questions in the chat and i see it guys i'm going to get to it momentarily but i do want to ask you a couple of things i mean of course during that time you have such great examples because when you get there in 97 vinnie dunn is still there it's a couple of years before he retired and mm. he'd been a chief for a long time he had division three at the time and you see his style of leadership by this point chief gancy had ascended in the ranks donald burns jerry barbara these are guys that even if you don't work with them every day, just by watching them at these scenes and the command they had, same thing with uh, Chief Fian, later Commissioner Fian, yes. you really pick up a lot of key details that help you in your own style, I imagine. Yeah, you, you see people 
doing the job and um, it's like, I want to be like them. I want to take their interests. Uh, Vinnie Dunn, Chief Dunn, his understanding of, of building construction. Um, uh, uh, Chief Fian, his understanding of the, the entire department and, and how the different components of the, of the department works, works together. And, and, and the list goes, goes on and on and on. And, um, and I was fortunate to, to work with, with these leaders and, and learn from them. I talk about this as the other thing, and then I'll get to those questions from, from you guys in the chat. And thank you for submitting them. And I, I talk about this a lot with uh, my friends who are former alumni of the New York City Transit Police. And that is the subways, a city within a city. And, you know, you talk about millions of people taking that every day. You're down there often sometimes for the messy man under jobs that nobody likes. There's just there's no winning with man under jobs and also subway fires. Mm -hmm. As a chief, what was your bl personal blueprint, if any, on how to combat emergencies in the subway, depending on what they were? Um, and I've had a number of fires in the subway mm -hmm. and in the tunnel underneath the East River which is really challenging because you have units on the Manhattan side and you have units on the, on the Brooklyn side. And I can remember the, the one fire. Um, so it's big fire, um, a lot of units. So there's deputy chiefs and I was a battalion chief. I went down into the tunnel, going back to that, sharing the risk with my firefighters. And I remember walking from Manhattan, uh, just about all the way to Brooklyn under the tunnel, uh, trying to lo locate with my firefighters the, the fire, extinguish it, and to ensure that there were no trains in, in that tunnel. Yeah, it's unique. I don't I don't envy what you have to do there because, you know, it's, it's a, such a compact space. On top of that, of course, you do have the added element. Sometimes you really cannot see because it's a dark tunnel to begin with. You add smoke into that element, and that's true risk right there. Yeah, and you, you only carry so much air on your back. So mm -hmm. if you have smoke, uh, it, it becomes really dangerous. I believe you guys are trained with the Scott Packs to pace your breathing. They call it combat breathing, right? Yeah, yeah. Or um, I was a, a scuba diver from all those lifeguard experience stuff. Mm -hmm. So I knew how to make my, my air last for a long time. Mm -hmm. And as you just said, you pace your breathing, you're conscious of the breathing, and you don't let it run past you. Because yeah. you could leave a cylinder in no time, or you could make it last. Yeah, that's true. Now to those uh, questions in the chat, let me just scroll back up to find them here. And again, thank you guys for submitting them. There's so many of you in the chat tonight. I thoroughly appreciate it. We had one from Stu Kelsall here, and this is the first one. He says, question for the chief. Who were influences? We kind of just talked about it, but maybe you could expand on it. Who were influences on your leadership style outside of the fire department? I uh, followed your interviews and documentaries and have found you to be incredibly inspiring. Thank you, Stu, for that question. Thank you. Um, well, there were a number of people, and and, and actually, I, I I mentioned two of them in my book that I I, I remember as a as a young child, literally as a as a, as a twelve year old um, uh, or younger, right? And um, and that, that was of, of people that dreamt of ways to do things differently. And and the, and the, it was Martin Luther King. Um, I have a dream, and I remember reading his his his, his uh, writings from the Birmingham jail, um, and not allowing that to crush him, but to to dream dif differently. And then Robert Kennedy, of um, I remember his words of some see things as they are, and say why. I dream things have never was and say, why not? And unfortunately, those two leaders w were assassinated. Yeah. Months apart. Yeah. But they dreamt of, of what could be. And, and, and that had a major influence in my career and certainly post 9-11 where we had to change um, not only as a department, as a city, as a country, but but globally and, and those words from these 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 two leaders just resonated in, in my my thoughts that yeah we we can make a difference 
we, we could dream of, of new things and, and, and make it safer for our firefighters, our first responders, and mostly for, for the community and the people that we serve. The late Tom Brennan had a great line, and I heard this recently and jogged in my memory again. You can never learn enough about a job that can kill you. Yes. Yeah. That's a great line. Yeah, so true. Yeah. Such and, a true statement. And firefighting is, is one of the most dangerous jobs around. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's, it's um, actually more firefighters are killed than, than police officers. And we would think it was the opposite. No, it's it, not. It's and, and both jobs are extremely dangerous. Um, there's no doubt about that. And, and, and the people that go into it, um, they know that, even though many times we just want to kind of put that to the back of our minds. We, we know how dangerous it is. And, and so do our families. Right. I mean, it's, it's and I, I talked about this with Captain Tardio. It's not cliche to say for any police officer or any firefighter, to your point, that when you walk out that door, and this was certainly true on 9-11, as we'll discuss momentarily, it could very well be your last time walking out that door. And for many first responders that morning, it was. Exactly. And, and uh, but they, they knew. They knew they were, they were going into danger. Yeah. Um, I, I can remember seeing my firefighters come into the, into the World Trade Center on 9-11. And I could tell you that every firefighter, every EMT and paramedic, every fire marshal, every police officer, everyone that responded that day looked at the burning building and they knew they were going to the most dangerous fire, the most dangerous incident of their lives. And they made a personal choice to go in. Yes, this is our job. We get that, but they also made a personal choice to go in um, into danger. And that's something that we'll touch on in just a bit. The other question came from Mike Milner, who's a retired member of Rescue 4, and he can certainly attest to that and then what his company did that day. 1998, a year after you became a battalion chief and you were in Manhattan, we had the formation of Ray Downey Special Operations Command, and all the rescues are rolled into it. And you have some of the squads, some of the previously engines that were formed in the squads. I mentioned 288 in Manhattan, you get squad 18. And you also have rescue one, which was there for years. And they have an illustrious history as a chief. What was your relationship with those uh, two companies? Well, as a, a covering officer, mm -hmm. I covered in the rescue companies. So that, that was kind of part, part of it. So particularly rescue four, I've, I've worked in rescue four and I, I worked in a, uh, um, most of the other rescues are one one point or another. So um, I, I had this this warm relationship with rescue um, because I worked in their in their uh, their unit as as, as an officer. Um, but f my relationship with rescue is I want them to do a specific job. So I would order them to for a particular task. I have units spread out the building, but I need this done. And um, because I knew the offices, it was simply a, a radio transmission. Hey, Lieutenant Lou or Cap, can you take your unit up to the top floor and let me know um, how the searches are, do, are going or whatever it may, may, may be, or uh, if there's a crane collapse in Manhattan, um, I need their, their special tools and, and expertise along with my, my other units. It's funny you mention that because literally about three weeks after SOC was formed, you do have that crane collapse in 1998 in Manhattan that took out quite a few buildings and unfortunately killed a woman. Yeah. Did you go to that? I, I didn't go that to that particular one. Okay. Um, probably one of the few that I, I didn't go to. <laughs> yeah, it was like that for a few weeks while they, uh, you know, got the crane out of there and, of course, uh, you know, respectfully removed that woman's body. But it's so true. And you talk about, I mean, Rescue One, my God, you turn around and you, you hop on the radio or you're at a scene, you turn around, there's Terry Hatton, there's Dennis Malik or Mike Penna. You know, you must have felt like, okay, we're all good here, you know, seeing those Yeah, guys. and I, I, I knew Terry Hatton. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and, and certainly 9-11, uh, I... I spoke to Terry in the yeah. lobby. So 
and ordered him up. And, and he was not afraid. I think it was Tim Brown, a uh, veteran of Rescue 3, that when he was on the yes. show told me, you know, that uh, they spoke. And, and uh, he says, when he hugged Tim, I, I love you, brother. I don't know if I'll see you again. But as you said, that personal choice. And it's so true because the previous episode was with the I have a mini series on the show, as you know, profiling retired members of the bomb squad. Uh, yeah. And they lost one of their members, Detective Claude Richards, on 9-11. And, you know, they went down there. And as they were getting ready to go down there, his partner, Steve Berbert, said, all right, guys, we have to be careful. I think the building is going to fall. He worked in the construction industry previously. He knew the building's pretty well. And Detective Richards turned to him and said, we're going down there to help people. What, you're going to argue with me about this? He's like, no, I'm not going to argue. We're going to go down. So knowing the situation, it takes a special amount of courage. And, and before I do get to that day, uh, and the courage shown by everyone involved, civilians and first responders alike. I always like asking about this newer chief during this time. So everybody thought in the summer of 99, that the great you know day in which 2000 was going to arrive and we were going to start the new millennium, chaos would ensue. And uh, I talked with some of my friends from SOC about that and you know what preparations that went into that. And they had generators in their firehouse in case the power went out. I don't know how much of a hand you had in preparations for Y2K, but whatever you can recall from that, tell me about it. A lot. <laughs> I wrote the plan. Oh, wow. so I was detailed to headquarters, and I, 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 I and, and and others, of, of course, we wrote the, uh, the 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 plan, or contributed to the plan, for for that, and for op sale two thousand. So not only was it Y two K, but in July we had op sale two thousand. And uh, I, I had a, a stronger hand in, the, in in that, and I remember talking to Chief Chief Gansey and running the plan across him, and then 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 uh, Chief Fian, who was Deputy Commissioner Fian at the time, and getting their input al along with 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 you know with, with others as well. More shout outs to our friends in the live chat. You dizzy 1969, uh, Pete Pranzo, retired NYPD street crime lieutenant, John Latanzio, retired emergency service police officer, later detective, uh, truck three in the Bronx, and Paul Rogers, uh, who was a lieutenant in hazmat for the FDNY. Thank you, Paul. Good to see you. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in once again tonight for this milestone episode 200 with Chief Joseph Pfeiffer, volume 23 of the best of the bravest. Um, you know, we had some interesting details as well as a chief in Manhattan. There's a lot going on. You had ticker tape parades, of course, with the Yankees during that time. Of course. Concerts going on. So it's a lot to do. And it's a lot of fun, even though it's a lot of prep work and there is some stress involved because you want to make sure that everybody's safe. I imagine it had to be a pretty rewarding feeling. One of the perks of being a chief to get the, to get the chance to participate at such a high level in those things. Yeah. You, you, uh, I got to see a, lo a, a lot of good things. Um, um, preparation. Uh, putting out fires, um, and, uh, going to medical emerg emergencies, uh, uh, multi-casualty uh, events. Um, so um, what it is is that I'm proud of my my folks, my mm -hmm. firefighters and, and, and medical folks. I'm, I'm proud of, of what they do. And so it's it's nice to to give a little smile and say, okay, they're doing well. Yeah. You know, it's a department that's so big and you, you realize the city is about three times the size of the departments alone, NYPD and FDNY. But when you see how well they handle things, there's such a confidence that New Yorkers have, especially in their fire department. That's no knock to the PD. You know, they do their best as well. But there's such a confidence, you know, and such a pride they take in their fire department too. firmly feeling it to be. And I agree with this, the best fire department in the world. And, you know, even though these things are not easy, what I think a lot of us civilians admire about the FDNY is how easy you guys seem to make it look. Yeah, that's, I think that's the secret. Make it look easy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we also have, I don't know, um, over 200 firehouses and EMS stations across the city. So it's it's part of a neighborhood. It's, it's part of the structure of the neighborhood. And every kid um, somewhere in their education goes to a firehouse. <laughs> yeah. and, and, um, and I just remember when I was a captain and so many classes came to, to the firehouse on Northern Boulevard because it was surrounded by a, a, a school. Uh, great schools and uh, and that and those 
impressions of being in a firehouse um, and those memories never leave uh, a, a youngster. No, and who's to say that some of those kids aren't on the job themselves now? Ab absolutely. Yeah, those, those, uh, those girls and boys that, that came into the firehouse and uh, as, as uh, very young students in grade school, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them that are, are firefighters. That's a great thing. So, you know, that morning you've been, uh, you know, you've been working in Manhattan for a while and your story's out there. You've talked about it a lot. I've linked up for those of you that want to go watch the documentary as it was originally aired in 2002 by Jules and Gideon all day. It's linked in the description. You watched that first plane go in there. And what you said right away struck me in that you said that looked like a direct attack, I think to Eddie Fahey on your way down there. So, you know, we have sometimes vivid recollections, both as civilians and first responders alike, of previous emergencies. And maybe for you as a chief, you're taking a page out of a book. Okay, previously we had this emergency and what we did here worked. Maybe it can work here. Were you thinking along those lines on the way down there? No, there was, there was no page in a book of a plane used as a, a terrorist missile. Yeah. That, that didn't exist. Um, but it, I remember watching the plane literally aim for the building. Mm -hmm. So I knew this was a direct attack and said that on the radio. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier uh, about that being calm, I remember telling myself with a, with a hundred thoughts running through my mind, because I knew I was going to be the first incident commander, um, to calm myself down and to think, what do I need to do right now? So instead of trying to do a hundred things, what do I need to do in this exact moment? And when we pulled up, um, we knew that thousands of people um, were in the greatest moment of need. And, um, and as I said, the firefighters came in and firefighters, aren't quiet people at all <laughs> they're noisy but that morning they came in and we reported to me and and then other chiefs um they came in quietly and they would come up and say chief how can i help what do you need me to do and the plan was to go up evacuate the building, and then we'll regroup on the other top of floors to rescue those that can't get out. One thing I do want to ask about uh, that is that it, there's such a massive coordination effort that has to happen because it's not just you guys. There was two, there was three agencies with specific duties in terms of rescue. The Port Authority Police has their emergency service unit and they know the buildings well because they have jurisdiction over them. The NYPD has their emergency service unit, which was tasked to assist you guys as you went through the stairs, evacuating people. So in terms of any type of coordination you may have had, not just with fellow chiefs, but with them at the command post, how did that work at all? Um, there were people coming in, in the towers and, and um, some would report in, some, some wouldn't. Um, the command post, overall command post, was set up by Chief Gancy across the street. And because this was a, a fire, um, by city, by the city uh, executive order, the mayor's executive order, um, the, the, the uh, fire chief would be the incident commander. So you have a situation on, on like that on your hands. and. I think Chief Gancy was outside for a while at his command post with Commissioner Fian. I remember Chief Nigro mentioning something not on this show. He'll be on this show soon, but on, on once again, my friends over are getting salty. That he, as he was riding down there, he said to Pete, "Listen, I don't think we're going to be able to put this fire out because it's too difficult to climb that amount of staircases to get there." But one thing that I will say, and Stu Kelso, he points this out in the chat, and and it's such a great thing that he mentioned that. And I fully agree. It's like you read my mind, Stu. The calmness that went into it. You look at the video. It's not just you. you see Chief Hayden, Chief yeah. Palmer, Commissioner Fee, and Chief Downey as well. There's no, there's no panic going on with you guys. You guys were calmly giving orders, dispensing personnel. 
everybody, it's almost like everybody went into war mode. And it, technically, you guys were in a war. That was the first war in this uh, decades-long war on terror. But, there, I mean, I think it's a testament to your experience and all of you guys, not just you, that you were able to stay in the moment when so much is literally breaking down all around you. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and certainly, certainly all those chiefs that you mentioned and, and others, um, I could tell you at, at 9.03 that morning, when the second plane hit, and we're in the lobby, Chief Hayden, Chief Palmer, my, myself, um, Chief Cowan came in, uh, Chief Burns, um, and, 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 and other chiefs. At that moment when that plane hit, well, the question is, what do you do now? And what we did, we gathered like a football huddle, literally like a football huddle in a circle. And we made decisions on what to do next, who would stay in the, uh, in the North Tower, and who would go to the South. I want to backtrack for a second because it's this documentary, which became in my personal opinion, the definitive account of 9-11, uh, just because it was an accidental documentary. Jules and Gideon Day were not aiming, as they themselves said in the documentary, to make a video about the greatest rescue operation that's ever happened in New York City, and maybe even by extension the world, for crying out loud. They were trying to film a rookie firefighter. You get a young Tony Benetatos, who I think is a lieutenant now, out in Hazmat 1. Last time I checked, and he's learning the ropes. He's the, the wide-eyed, bushy-tailed, green proby, and they're filming him. Now, there's been many documentaries made about the FD and the PD. You know, some guys are tentative about being filmed, but you welcome them in with open arms. They're friends of Jimmy Hanlon. What was it like having those two in the firehouse? Because they seem like really funny, happy-go-lucky guys. <laughs> Our French filmmakers? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 were, they were great, and we, the guys would kid them all the time, but, but they were... They fit after a couple months in the firehouse. They fit right in. They they, they were just one of the guys, um, and uh, it was fortunate that Jules kept the camera ro rolling, um, and and stayed with me the, the entire time, because there was no smartphone where everybody had a camera. Um, that was the only picture of the first plane, and um, and inside the North Tower. And uh, there was a question earlier in the chat from Mike Thomas. Mike, I didn't forget about your question. I was just waiting for the right time. He wants to know if you still keep in touch with those two. Yes. I talked to Jules uh, um, about a week ago. Yes. And since then, we've worked on major projects and traveled the world. And we, we with, with Harvard University, uh, the Harvard Kennedy School, we looked at, and the Harvard Business School, we looked at the Paris attacks. And we, we talked to... Everyone that was involved in that, from the, the prime minister to the hostages and the firefighters and, and the police officers as well, and, and the doctors. So, um, and I, I needed a French translator, and Jules was perfect for that. <laughs> <laughs> Stu Kelsall says the lamb dinner fiasco still makes me laugh yes. from the night before. <laughs> yeah. No, so, you know, that day, uh, moving past it, there was so much loss. And before I get to kind of regrouping things, uh, and FDNY Riggs, I'll get to your question in a second. I see it. Thank you for submitting it. So many guys on the PD side and the FD side who had enough time on and that had to work the overtime at the pile, pile understandably, went down to the pension section and said, okay, I'm out. And it wasn't selfish. They had their earnings. Family came first. And nobody would begrudge them for leaving after something like that. You could have left. You were eligible. You had 20 years by that point. And you lost your brother, who I do want to ask you about momentarily. What kept you? What made you stay? Um, yeah, I could have retired actually six days before 9-11. <laughs> wow. um, but I stayed because I was, I, I knew what occurred that day. And then later, I was part of the team that, that worked with McKenzie and company and did the after action re review. So I, 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 I had a lot of knowledge, um, but there was also a lot of pain because we lost 343 firefighters, 37 Port Authority police officers and 23 NYPD police officers, not to mention totally um, 
2,753 people at the Trade Center alone, and almost 3,000 um, if we count the Pentagon and the, the, the plane that crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, but I think what, what I learned was that, that we had to take this pain of, of our losses and, and give it a purpose. That and for me, that purpose was was making change a, a, across the first responder community, and to to see to prepare for the, the next big event. Um, so I think when we go through these terrible events, we reflect on the past, we envision the future. And then we then we enhance the present with a new purpose, and um, and I've seen that in myself, and I've seen it with with uh, my colleagues, whether it's within the department or across agencies or across countries. We go through that same process, um, but we also do something else we connect to each other, we come together. And we see that after these disasters when people make the makeshift memorials of candles and flowers and, and people come together, whether it's, whether it's after 9-11 um, on the streets of New York and, and pictures or in the streets of, U Uvalde um, in Texas, um, we don't want to be alone. We, we want to be together and come away and take the pain into a new purpose to make things better. That I have a dream gets repeated over and, and over again. So well said and, and so true. And, you know, you look at the leadership of the fire department, and I'm pretty sure if, if Chief Gansey or Chief Downey could speak and we could bring them back, they would hate to see people hang their heads in sorrow and not push the department forward. You know, the ultimate tribute to everyone that lost their lives that day is to do exactly what you just said. And I don't, and to, to your point, I don't want to forget about Keith Romer from the fire patrol. We can't forget about him. He was the 344th firefighter, if you will. The eight emergency medical technicians, the three court officers, and uh, Special Agent Craig Miller of the Secret Service, as well as uh, Special Agent Leonard Hatton of the FBI, who also lost their lives in the line of duty that day. The question from FDNY Riggs, and Stu, I'll get to your other question momentarily, and thank you, brother, for submitting it, is, was there any large incidents within the World Trade Center complex post-93, pre-9-11, while working in Battalion 1? We, we, we had a... We, we had a, um, we would go there every day. <laughs> so we would have small incidents, um, some fires, not nowhere to compare. Um, but then I think it was maybe the 98 or 99. I have to, I have to look at, it. I think it was 1999. We did a full scale exercise and I, I was, I, I, I ran it of a third alarm assignment in two World Trade Centers, so the, 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 the South Tower. And we brought units from from Manhattan and then across the city into the into the area and, and we drilled. So we knew this building better than anyone ever did. I don't doubt it. I definitely don't doubt it. And now, Stu, to your question, Stu, he's firing them off left and right. And he's a night owl because it's one o'clock in the morning over there in the UK. So I, I thank him for staying up for this. You know, how much he's and since he's in the UK, that's why he asked his first question. How much of dialogue have you had with the UK fire service as it pertains to their fight against terrorism and their preparedness for any kind of emergency? Um, a lot, <laughs> a lot. The uh, the uh, London Fire Brigade, I've personally talked to um, many times, uh, especially around the um, the when they London was hosting the Olympics. Um, and uh, Chief uh, uh, Bernie Higgins, um, I, uh, I I work with. Um, so I can't even tell you how many calls we have. And just today, and I'm not, I'm trying to find the the, the email. 
because um, I got way too many emails <laughs> um, that uh, that uh, I had emails back and forth with the UK in the, in the fire service today with uh, with uh, with Bernie and also with uh, um, uh, the, one of the fire chiefs over there, uh, Sabrina. Uh, who, who she used to, uh, uh, Sabrina, Sabrina Cohen, uh, Haddon, mm -hmm. and we're planning to, to, um, get together on zoom and find out ways we could continue to work since both, uh, Bernie and I are retired and Sabrina is, is an active chief there, um, to get New York city and, and London together and to, to, um, to, to how do we prepare? How do we develop new leaders? So besides working at Harvard, I also work at Columbia University and we do a an executive program in the fall. And not only do we use bring people from New York City and, and the region together, but we also reach internationally. And this year we'll be on Zoom again. So, uh, if people are interested, um, I'll, I'll give you the link. And, and, and certainly if you go on to Columbia and look up uh, Leading with Impact, uh, they'll, they'll be, you'll be able to join and, and it'll, it'll be an international group uh, from the UK, from France. Last year we had from Brazil. So it's, a, uh, it's an amazing group when you have international uh, cooperation. There's so many questions in the chat. I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. And if I miss one, I'm sorry, guys. And I do have to still want to talk to you about, of course, your brother, the late Lieutenant Kevin Pfeiffer, and your book, Ordinary Heroes, which we'll get to. Stu, uh, second, go ahead. My apologies. And, and we're going to lose light here. So uh, I'm <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, we don't have a lot of light. So we can't yeah, go no too worries. much longer. <laughs> nah, we won't. No worries about that. So he, he Stu wants to know, of course, the FDNY's involvement in the uh, construction of the, new, of the current Trade Center complex. Yes, I was very involved in that. Um, uh, not as an engineer, but on, on, on certain things and, and working with, with safety systems and communication systems and, uh, and pre-fire plans. Yes. And the, the building is constructed differently than the old uh, trade center. And uh, Mike Thomas says, did you respond to the flight 587 crash in November of 2001? Um, no, no, I didn't. Um, but I, I know Chief Hayden, who lives in Rockaway, uh, who was with me uh, on 9-11, and actually was my boss, he, he was the deputy chief, um, and then became eventually chief of department. But, but he did respond to that, uh, that, that crash in the Rockaways. But I did respond to the US Air Flight uh, 15, 1549 that crashed in the, in the Hudson River. Was that 92 or 89? Um, that was, no, the, the, the plane in the, in the Hudson river was 2009. Oh, two, uh, chief. Yeah. Chief Sully. My apologies. Sully, something else. Yeah. 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 Or Captain Sully, I should say. Yeah. Captain Sully, uh, the, uh, landed in the, in the, in the East river. And I, instead of going to the scene, I stayed at the operations center because there was a, a number of chief operations and others going to the scene. And I pulled in chief Cassano, who was out chief of the department i said sal you need to stay with me um because we don't know if there's one plane or multiple planes at that point we, we were trying to get information mm -hmm. and what we did we had more information that we, we relayed to units at the scene because of our work with nypd we had live feed, feed video from nypd helicopters and i got live feed video from news helicopters we worked with the, the Department of Homeland Security, and we had, were connected to a Homeland Security information network. Um, so we were able to connect to people across the United States. So one little quick story I'll, sure. I'll tell you is that we sent the fire marshal to LaGuardia Airport, who was at LaGuardia Airport going on vacation, um, but he had a, we had to change his plans a little bit. And he got the manifest from the plane. And everybody had to go through our EMS, a medical evaluation, or we, we contacted hospitals. 
So I sent our EMS chiefs into a conference room of our operations center with the manifest and, and everyone we had contact with that, we, that came off the plane. And they were looking at two large screen uh, uh, TVs. And before anyone else knew it, we knew that all 155 passengers and crew were alive and rescued. So what do you do with that information? <laughs> you have a press conference? Well, that takes a while. So yes, so yes Commissioner Scapetta at the time was with, with Mayor Bloomberg um, and we radioed to them. We told our units in the field, but at the same time, I had one of my lieutenants in the operations center sign in to his in Homeland Security Information Network and put that on, on the website for, for the National Operations Center that was down in Washington, D.C. And as soon as that hit, the Secretary of Intelligence and Analysis, Charlie Allen, gave me a call and he asked me one question. And I bet you your, your audience could guess what, what the question was. He said, Joe, is that information correct? And I said, yes, sir, it is. This next call was to the uh, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. And then the next call after that was to the White House. So just think about this for a second. A fire chief was two degrees of separation to the President of the United States. And every governor, every mayor, the airlines, and anybody else that was on that, that network. So we've come a long way of, of sharing information together and to do it in real time. And that's kind of the thing that you hit on, and that answers one of the questions I was originally going to ask you. When you look at the FDNY's Counterterrorism Bureau and, and or Counterterrorism and Emergency Preparedness, I should say, a lot of people think of terrorism as a law enforcement issue, and to an extent, it certainly is. But who are the first responders there on the scene immediately in charge of rescuing and rendering aid? It is the fire department. It is EMS. So to have a department, that, a fire department, that is, that has its own bureau and has the level of preparedness that you guys do as evidenced by that case and many more that I'm sure we don't even know about, don't have the time to get into, it's a testament to the intelligence that New York City has and the foresight to prevent the next one, as you said earlier. Yeah, and I didn't, in a, I didn't create a bureau. Mm -hmm. I created a center. And I did that on purpose. Mm. Bureau's very hierarchical and everybody gets, you know, into their own little world. I created a center um, where we bring people together. And instead of having a, a headquarters, and here I had an office at headquarters, but I had a whole building in Fort Tobin mm. that overlooked uh, Bayside Bay by the Throgs Neck Bridge. And FDNY and NYPD worked together along with uh, OEM or NISM, and, and we worked together. And I worked with special operations um, and, and ESU and, um, and, and, and so many other NYPD chiefs. I, did. I wasn't sure if I knew more NYPD chiefs or fire chiefs. Um, but, and we did this for years and years. And, and, um, before I retired, I could tell you that we had a rescue task force where police officers would lead our, our medical folks in. And, and I could tell you that those officers would step out in front of a bullet to protect us. And our firefighters would crawl under bullets to save a police officer. And I don't say that lightly. Um, we did it together. But I, I'll let your viewers know a little secret, which I do mention in my book, that it, I used a French recipe. So besides meeting at a, a nice place where people could talk and doing full-scale exercises and training together, the secret was to feed them. So before every meeting or after every meeting, I had light duty firefighters that would cook a meal. And when you break bread together, you build a level of trust. And when you have a level of trust across agencies, you're willing to put your life on the line for your, your fellow first responder. And if anything, I'm, I'm most proud of the relationship between FDNY 
and NYPD now. Hopefully of course. There. And um, and officers and firefighters will tell you that we're in this together. I saw that firsthand when I did a ride along with emergency service recently. They have the fire department on a frequency with them. Mm -hmm. If they need the fire department for something, they'll call them in and vice versa. If the fire department needs ESU for something, uh, they'll call them in. If you would have said that to an ESU cop or an FDNY firefighter, especially one in rescue 25, 30 years ago, they would have said, what? You know, but here we are we, all we, these we, decades we are, later. We are. And, and your, your, your hundredth episode with uh, Deputy Commissioner John Miller, um, he, he, along with his chiefs there, uh, um, he was my counterpart. And we sat down, I can't even tell you how many times we're working together. We even did an exercise on the new, in the new one World Trade Center on the 63rd floor that, that John and I ran together with, with police officers, firefighters, uh, building managers, medical doctors, and we flew in people from Paris, first responders that responded to the Bataclan and the doctors that worked on patients and the police officers that carried shields into the, in, 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 into the Bataclan and, and got fired at. So uh, um, I, I can't say enough how the counterterrorism between do both departments uh, have worked with each other. Uh, over the last two decades. A couple more topics and then we will get to the rapid fire. It's been a great show with you. I did mention your brother and then I'll talk about your book, Lieutenant Kevin Pfeiffer. Um, you know, when you look back on him, he, he was a hero long before that day, of course. He had a very distinguished career in his own right. What are some of your fonder memories of him? Uh, Kevin was also a paramedic. And um, uh, be, be, before uh, EMS, be, uh, before health, health and hospital became EMS. Um, and he loved being a paramedic and he never gave it up. Mm -hmm. So even as a firefighter and a lieutenant, he, he still did the paramedic stuff. So I remember him um, loving the fire department and he was in engine 33, which, which is on Great Bone Street. So in, around NYU. <laughs> um, and uh, and he just loved going to work every day. And, and he was a, an adventurer. So he, would, he had a, a 18 foot Hobie cat where we would sail in Jamaica Bay. And he had a, a plane, a little Cessna, and he was a pilot and he would fly. So he was a little more adventurous than I. I was more the, <laughs> the uh, academic one. <laughs> We well, both turned out great, and I'm sure your parents were both very, very proud of you. Nevertheless, I have your book here, and then this will be the last detail before rapid fire. And it's ordinary heroes. Now, it's difficult sometimes to put this in perspective. It's one thing to verbalize it; it's another thing to write it down. Because there's so many stories from that day. What prompted you to write that book? After really after 20 years, I had a lot of time to reflect on what took place and. And everything I did that day is either on video or audio tape. So um, I don't have any secrets. It's all there in, in, in the public. Uh, but I wanted to walk people through what it was like that day, what it was like for, for me and my firefighters and, and the days after. Um, and I picked the title Ordinary Heroes because after 9-11, people asked me, how do you define a hero? And my definition of a hero is one who does ordinary things, but at an extraordinary time. And that's what we saw on 9-11. And that's what we see every day as our first responders run into danger. And um, we're not superheroes. We don't leap buildings in a single bound. Um, but we'll run into danger so others may live. And that's why I entitled it Ordinary Heroes and take people through the story of walking in my shoes, in my firefighter shoes, that day, the days and the months and the years after, and, and what that feels like and, um, and what it means to lead 
that the the heart of crisis leadership is the ability to 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 you to uh, sustain hope by unifying effort to solve complex problems in the face of great tragedy and that's what we did then and that's what we to do today whether we're looking at at mass violence um, in the United States and other parts of the world or we're looking at the effects of climate change and and dealing with wildfires and 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 hurricanes or many other disasters it's it's only by unifying our efforts can we make a difference and it is our ordinary heroes um, that will make that difference today as well as they did yesterday i don't man i i don't even know how to top that Wow, what an episode. What a 200th episode. We have one more segment to get through. It's the rapid fire. It's quick. It's five hit and run questions for me, five hit and run answers from you. You can say pass when you, if you want to. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. If not for firefighting, what other career field could you have seen yourself pursuing? <laughs> um, well, the, the one I'm pursuing now, the, the one in the ac academic world uh, where I teach about crisis leadership. Oh, there you go. Second, best firehouse cook you ever worked with. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to answer that question because uh, <laughs> there were so many firehouse cooks and they were all wonderful. And um, and, and the meal is is what brought us all together. There you go. That's a good answer. Second, or excuse me, third rather, favorite thing to do during your downtime? My favorite thing to do in my downtime is what I did today. Hmm. I sailed with my son on, on Jamaica Bay. We had a nice nice wind in the morning and then we we uh we don't have the Hobie Cat any longer. We we have a 21 foot sailboat and uh there's nothing better to being out on the on the water with uh, the breeze in your hair and just going by wind power. And today was a beautiful day for it. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't it wasn't cold at all. It was a perfect summer day. A perfect day. A perfect day indeed. Fourth favorite thing about New York City. It's just people, and and that people come from around the world, and uh, and and that that diversity is 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 our special source uh, that New York has, and I and I love it. It was Mayor Dinkins, the late Mayor Dinkins. I called it a cultural mosaic. And he was right then, and he's right now. And right. so, fifth and finally, if you can grab somebody fresh out the academy, they just graduated from the Rock. You know, it's a new firefighter and they're eager to get on the job and eager to start. Given your experiences in a 37 year career, what advice would you give them? My advice would be to put, you, put your, the people you work with, watch out for them. Uh, be conscious of who you're with. Always have a way out or a plan B, I should say, and know that that we we run into, into dangers so others may live. And to put putting ourselves on the line is what we do as as firefighters, as as a uh, medical personnel, as law enforcement. So we're, we're in this together. And that opportunity to save someone's life or to make a difference in someone's life is is the, the the greatest honor one could have and the greatest career one could have i concur i want to thank you stick around we'll say goodbye off the air and let me just say goodbye to my audience thank you guys for tuning in tonight thank you for all your questions i'm sorry i couldn't get to all of them of course but thank you for no, nevertheless making this a very special episode. I don't know how I got here, as I said at the top, but, you know, through hard work and persistence, you know, look at Chief Pfeiffer. It took me four years, almost five, to get him. But finally, I did get him. And here we are at 200 episodes, hard to believe. And there's many more to come down the pike. So thank you to everybody, past and present and future, too, that's made this show what it is. And I'll see you Monday for episode 201 at 6 o'clock. Like I said, Chief, stick around. I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. It was a great show. And on behalf of retired FDNY Chief, 
Joe Pfeiffer. This has been volume 23 of the Best of the Bravest interviews with the FTNY's Elite in the Milestone episode 200. I'm Mike Cologne, and we will see you next time. Have a great weekend, everybody, and thanks again for making this milestone so special. Good night. Thank you.